This is a fairly tidy page for Baxter. But you can see these little extra marks here. This is part of the, the um, reliquiae. Um, the preface, preface here, it says crossings out. This is very Baxter's sort of techniques, writing down the margins. As you can see, as the item that stood next to it ended there. So we get this little edge that's stood beyond the book and been affected by the light and the dirt, the atmosphere, and just slowly got knocked off as people have um, read the manuscripts. And this is um, a sheet that's more damaged, more dirty, but what we've had to do is, I mean, there's only so much dirt you can get off. We just had to give it a supporting Japanese mend so that um, the edges aren't friable anymore. Yeah, th this is because it's like a stub binding. They've got all these stubs to, they're supposed to compensate and give space for each letter, but it, it didn't work like that at all. Um, so you can see that's the old spine there with the, you can see the sewing, and there was a, a very, very thick layer of animal glue all over the back. It took hours and hours to take off. That was my job was to disbind, so to take all this um, rubbish off the back and, and slowly free the original letters and original papers without damaging them. were folded, uh, over-sewn. They were actually cut to fit into the binding. Sometimes they put something in and they thought, hmm, that doesn't look quite right, it's sticking out a bit. So you get a lovely wavy line where somebody's got a pair of scissors and cut straight through and, and, and then there's half words, you know. it's uh, so, so there's most... Um, damage you would imagine happens to paper as happened. However, the amount of um, pro problems with the ink isn't, isn't terribly severe, considering how the, the uh, manuscripts were kept. So, you know, you, you get this terrible breakdown of ink and uh, that causes all sorts of problems. We have got some, as you can see um, from something like that, which a combination of cheap paper, not very well sized, but then not looked after, um, is a problem. So, but fortunately it's, um, I suppose about 10% of the seven volumes are very damaged. And some of it's pretty neat still, you know, it's, it's, uh, it survived very well, but then that's very good quality paper there. Things are all sorts of sizes, so if you had something tiny next to something large, you'd find that the dirt had got in and that whole of that would be stained with dust and you just have one clean square where the next manuscript sat very closely, lay beside it. So we've, I think probably the amount of time we spend on cleaning is enormous and we've used um, smoke sponges and um, grated rubber and brushes and uh, just taken our time and spent a lot of time removing as much dirt as possible and in some cases we weren't unable to move the dirt because the binder rather than dry clean the pages in many cases got a sponge and just took the sponge over the paper and so the dirt set in so you get quite a lot of pages that look like that. And you can actually see the line of the sponge so um, we've done our best to make it readable and uh, accessible. Whereas the, the treatises, obviously, they're not addressed. We're not quite sure where they're written. We know when he's living in Kidderminster, he's using paper marked with a post horn, and it's quite heavy, uh, a medium size, not the very best, but not the worst. Um, and we know when it comes to London, we, we are getting beautiful cream coloured paper. Um, and we're getting paper of the highest quality sometimes. Um, we know when he's in prison. Um, he is using, um, I think, probably one of the best papers that, that's around in the 17th century from the mills in a district called Angoulême. And they're, these mills, they're run by Dutch factors who 
have bought up the French paper mills because they're so good at making paper. Their rivers don't freeze. Um, their paper's clean, beautiful, uh, made of a good linen rag. Um, and uh, they're watermarked with both the paper maker's name and often the factor's mark. So we know that a chap called Abraham Janssen is owning some of those mills. And he's got one son in Amsterdam selling paper in a shop, one son in London sets up Theodore Janssen, sets up a paper shop here. So, I mean, it's possible they bought them from his paper shop. Mm. I can't be precise about that, but certainly it's his watermark. And you'll find it's used for Purcell and other things. People have written about this paper now. It's beginning to come out in people's academic writing about paper. Um, and it's also uses that when he's in prison. So we, we know that um, Roger Morris used it because... But Roger Morris bought big, thick writing books would cost a bomb compared to quires of paper. And um, we know that his amanuensis worked for Richard Baxter. So there is a link there. And I did compare that paper with some of his paper. And I wrote to a paper maker in France who said it's not just from the same paper mill. He said he believed it was made on the same day. We know that at times Baxter didn't have much uh, money um, uh, and uh, we also know he, he just wasn't, he wrote so much he didn't want to waste paper. So we, we get um, these densely written sheets all the time. I mean, I, I have seen it even more dense. It was seeing if he's using a wide nib, it really is. Um, and sometimes the ink breaks down because it's obviously been um, not in, kept in poor environments. But um, that's Midway. That's obviously written in Kidderminster. This is um, this is paper he's working on in London. And happy for us who love the history of paper and uh, want to learn all we can about it and obviously teach everyone else about it. This has still got its deckled edge. So it's the exact size of the paper when it was made. And... Um, It's a very good quality paper. You can see the creaminess of it. You know, it's really quite beautiful. Um, and he was purchasing that in London. So it's one of the Janssen family um, papers. So, and he quite often uses that when he's in London writing the history of his life. The pin is there and he's avoided that whole piece of the paper. He's written you know, as, as far as the pin allows the paper to open, um, he, he's just gone with that. And so he's got a, a nice triangle shape of plain paper at the bottom. So um, sometimes not. Um, and he's often, after he writes a little booklet in October, Octavo size, he will pick up any scrap of paper and use it as a cover. So a little piece of music paper, an old letter. Um, he's... Um, somebody who works very quickly, very efficiently, very rapidly. You know, he makes up his ink and he just gets on with it and it flows. Um, just folds his paper and slips a pin in the fold, in the middle of the fold, and slips the point into the paper. So it's like a little hinge, really. And a number of people worked like this, but often people in libraries take the pins out because they think they're going to do damage. They don't work out brass and tin is fine. It's not iron, it's not going to rust do keep them in, because we can actually date them. How do you date pins once they're out, you know? So it's, it's quite important. Because he worked at such speed, um, his, his ideas were so energetic that he would then come back to them and realise that there was something he wanted to add. So he'd make these little slips of paper and make a, a little bar gate or some sort of mark on the paper and the place where it needed to fit. So you have quite a number of these throughout the volume so that you... Um, uh, know where to put them. It's not always easy because sometimes he uses the same mark to know exactly where they go, but I suppose that's the job of Neil Keeble and his 